Oh, it's good to be back. It's really, really good to be back, actually. I, um, I uh, yeah, had my, had my time in there, and, and I don't wish to go back. Makes you wonder sometimes, hey, why do, why do good things happen to bad people, and why do bad things happen to good people? You ever asked that question? You ever wondered about that? Why do... Why is it that I was just, I was reading, I want to turn to 2 Kings in a moment. Actually, if you've got a Bible, you can do it now. 2 Kings chapter 13. <laughs> and I'm reading in, in uh, 2 Kings 13 about this king, and he's a, not a real good guy. He's done, a, done the wrong thing by God. But yet there's this verse there where it says, but because, even though he was evil and done the wrong thing, the Arameans were coming against him. He was the king of Israel at the time, Judah at the time. And of Israel, and as the this Arameans were coming against them, God, it says, even though he was evil, God came and defended him and, and helped him out. And I go, there's so much about God I don't understand. And, and if you understand everything about God, come let me know. You can preach for the next 52 weeks. And you can give us some of your insight, but there's so much about God that I don't understand. But here's what I do understand, that 2,000 years ago, a man called Jesus, who was the Son of God, came to earth. That's a fact. I, I believe that to be a fact. I, that, that doesn't get shaken because I've got COVID, or that doesn't get shaken because oh, I'm not getting my way. That, that, that historical fact doesn't change because I'm not feeling 100%, or because I'm not able to go out and get a bacon and cheese zinger burger or any of the little luxuries of life which by the way I still haven't had I've done well I came out on Friday and I've stayed away from all that stuff um, um, I do look thin don't I yes yes I, I, don't, I don't understand all that but what I do know is that Jesus came and he died upon a cross 2,000 years ago and that, that that for me to have forgiveness from sin and for me to be wiped clean and for me to have access back to a relationship with God I've got to go through him regardless of whether I feel good whether I uh, have got a goose bump when I went to church or whether I fell over when they prayed for me whether I heard an audible voice or saw something written in the sky or had a miracle experience <coughs> um, I, I was just saying to, to Jackie um, the other day that um, uh, you know, I, I was in isolation for that time, and um, you know, uh, I, I guess for some people, uh, they would would potentially think, well, that that, that would be heaven because you're in isolation and all you could do is read the Bible and be with the Holy Spirit and just enjoy God. And while that is wonderful and true, and yes, you could do all that. Well, w one problem with being in isolation with COVID is you don't enjoy anything. Okay, uh, and, and so yes, I spent time reading the Bible and I spent time praying and uh, uh, all that stuff and just sitting in every night before I'd go to sleep I'd sit in bed and go well God you've trapped me in this room Lord so what have you got for me and I'd look at the roof and wait for it to part and for clouds of glory to descend upon me and angelic beings to start singing in beautiful tones and all I saw was the stinking ceiling every night it didn't part once for me nothing came down from heaven I didn't see a cloud I didn't have a, like, nothing. And then the next night, I'd, in great anticipation and expectation, sit up and go, well, God, before I go to bed tonight, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. It's going to be all right. Something's going to happen, God. I know it is. And I'd sit in bed and I'd wait and wait and nothing happened. That's okay, God. Because my faith is not based on some experience or some great whiz-bang moment that I have with you. My faith is tied to a moment in human history that regardless of how I feel now, doesn't change that that happened. doesn't change that that was the method and the means by which God himself said, for all eternity, for you to have a relationship with me, you're going to have to go through this moment in human history. None of that changed because my feelings changed. Because I was not necessarily on top of a, a mountain, I was down in a valley. <laughs> But it's interesting because anyone ever sit in water for an extended period of time? Anyone sat in water? And when you got in, you were just this beautiful, pristine, oil of you land example of a human being. Just perfect. But you sit in there for too long and then you get out of the water and after a while you notice that all of a sudden those, 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 my, my 49-year-old hands look like they're 99. You ever have that? The, it's, everything starts to crinkle up. You ever notice that? It, it, change takes place while you're soaking and just sitting in the water. No one ever sits in the water and goes, make them wrinkly, make them wrinkly. We don't, <coughs> pardon me, we don't do that. 
Nobody does that. But, but as you immerse yourself in the water and you're just sitting there, without realising it, how many of you know change is taking place? You spend a lot of time in that water, change takes place. And when I came out, you know what I can say is I never had the, the sky part, I never had the, the, you know, the, the roof pull back and hear them angelic beings, but I do know this, that change took place. I do know this, I do know that, that something happened, not even realise at the time, but coming out of it, it, it's almost like I'm looking at myself going, oh, I'm noticing some wrinkles now. And I'm glad about that. So not like age, but, but I'm noticing that, you know, God, you were speaking to me and you were with me. And, and in the moment, because I just felt so terrible, I, I just didn't connect with that. I just wanted to get out of my room. I just wanted the headache to disappear and all the other stuff to happen and resume life again and see my family. My wife would, would, would come to the door and open the door and, because we, I was isolated and, She'd bring me foods and she, she waited on me. I mean, I, I, one blessing, I said, God, it's taken COVID for me to finally get that. <laughs> That's a joke. She always waits on me. I was going to preach on risk and right there was a great example. Taking a risk. But while I was in there, and I came out and I realized, you know what, this, this is, this is how God, isn't this how God works with most of us? It's, it's a gradual thing. I think Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven. He said, it's like a, a seed and a farmer plants it and he comes out and he waters and so on and it says, and the seed grows and the farmer himself doesn't even know how. It just happens. And before you know it, this thing that called a mustard seed, that's this tiny little seed, becomes a tree that just other things rest on and it gives shade and so on but it's this some people think the kingdom of god is like a bazooka don't we you just aim and fire bang and the entire landscape changes in a moment and that might be the the, the story for some people in certain situations but i find most of the time the kingdom of god is, is like that seed that just soaks just spends time in the presence of whether it realizes it or not but we're connected to god and we love god and god loves me and and, and he's with me all the time and I'm just kind of soaking in that presence of God. And there's something about that that eventually what happens is transformation and change starts to come even when we don't realise it. Even when we don't realise it. it. It's amazing how many people over my years of pastoring and so on, how many people have, have, have come and sat in a, a gathering like this. And they weren't believers. They didn't follow Jesus. But they came and they just sat. They just hung out in the environment, spent time not even realising what they were doing, just soaking. And then, before you know it, they're attending Bible studies or they're praying and they're worshipping and everything. And if you went to them and said, what was the moment? They'll go, well, I, don't really, I don't really know. It, it, I, just, I just believe that what Jesus did was for me and now I'm worshipping Jesus. And, 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 and I know that that might freak some people out because we feel like there's got to be this defining moment. And for many people, I, I believe there is a defining moment. There is a moment where we consciously decide. But for some people, that, 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 that gradually creeps up on them. And they can't give you a time or a date. But you just, you just soak and you be with God. And God begins to transform and, and change our life. So while I was there, all that to say, while I was in there, I, I do feel like when I came out that, that all of a sudden I started having these thoughts. And I'm thinking, God, that's a really new thought to me. I've never thought that before. As a matter of fact, it's plain as the nose on my face now when I go back and I look at your word. But you know what? I've never, ever thought that before. Just from being with him. Not trying to be with him even. Not even trying to, to consciously make myself feel like I'm with him. Just, just knowing that he is with us. That's why I guess Christianity is a lifestyle, not a moment. Not something we pop in and out of. It's, it's, it's life. It's walking with God. Jesus said to the disciples, come follow me. Come follow me. And if you will just follow me, I'll make you into something. He said to them, I'll make you fishers of men. I think Matthew 4, 19. He said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. But he said, your job is just follow me. I'll do the making. Let me make you into something. Let me, you know, some people get caught up on, 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 on destiny and purpose and all these things. And I wonder whether our obsession, being caught up on what's my destiny, what's my... I wonder whether some of us completely miss our purpose and destiny because we're so focused on our purpose and destiny. We're so focused on, on what's that thing, God? What's that eye of a needle thing you have for me? And God's saying, you know what? Just walk with me today, would you? If you walk with me today and get out of bed tomorrow and just decide you're going to walk with me tomorrow, then you get out of bed the next day and you just make the decision you're going to walk with me the next day. Guess what? In 12 months' time, I'll guarantee you this. You'll be exactly where Jesus is. Because you just woke up each day and you just walked with him. And you'll probably look back down the path and go, who is this person now? I, I, I'm different. 
I'm different. How did that door open for me? How did that opportunity come? How did I find myself in that situation? Well, I just made the decision just to walk with Jesus, just to walk with God. Hey, I'm saying all that to somehow get to this. There's a really funny encounter in, in, in the book of Kings about the prophet Elisha. Who knows about Elisha? There was two big prophets back in the day, Elijah and Elisha. Why they couldn't have called them Matthew or Max and Thomas? Two totally separate names, but they're not. They're so close together that people get them wrong. Elijah, Elisha. No, well, this one's Elisha. He's the one that came after Elijah. And uh, Elisha, God did amazing things through the life of this man. Amazing uh, miracles and signs and wonders and spoke uh, prophetically to the nation of Israel. And uh, God, God did some wonderful, <coughs> wonderful things through this man. But there's the most interesting uh, story about his life actually happened after he died. And it's these obscure two verses. And if you read the context of before and after, it's almost like, why would you put that there? It doesn't seem to make any sense or even connect at all. It's two verses in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20 to 21, and here's what it says. It says, Elisha died and was buried. Elisha contracted some kind of disease. Again, going back to that question, why do good people, bad things happen? So, oh, we don't know. But we know if you go back early that Elisha contracted some kind of disease. That's all it tells us. And Elisha died of this particular disease. Why did God not heal it? I, I don't know. What I do know is that he eventually died. And death will come to all of us at some point. Who agrees with that? That's one thing everyone in this room has in common. I don't care whether you're male, female, whether you're affluent, not. I don't care what your, your position is in life, your status, your job. At some point, the clock will wind down for every single one of us. Is that true? clock will wind down for all of us. But we, we don't get focused on when the clock's going to wind down. It's not about what we're going to do then. It's, it's what are you doing now? Because what we do now makes the big difference for what, we, what ends up happening then. But we've got to live in the now. And, and, and this story amazes me. <laughs> and here's why. It says, Elijah died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. So these Moabites would come on in and they would, would beat up the Israelites and, and, and oppress them and steal from them and so on. And so you've got this situation where Elisha dies, so then they get Elisha and you can imagine the Paul Bear is there and they're carrying old Elisha out and they're going to put Elisha in his grave and bury Elisha. And then verse 21, once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. So here we are walking along with this dead guy and they look across and go, oh, the Moabites are coming. And so in a panic... What do we do? Chuck him in the nearest, they must have been near Elisha's grave, Elisha's tomb, and it must have been somewhat easy to open or whatever. And in that panicked moment, what do they do? They just chuck his body into the tomb where Elisha's been buried. And Elisha's bones are in this tomb. And then what do they do? Well, they turn and run because the raiders are coming to do them harm. So can you just imagine the picture. We're walking along all solemn funeral procession. Ah, the Moabites chuck the dead body and take off. So much for decorum, so much for respect for the dead. They just toss his body in and they take off. But something interesting happens. It says in verse 21, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elijah's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Wow, this book, it, it has some amazing stories in it. That one freaks me out. Here's the dude, he's dead. The raiders come, they throw a dead man into a grave. The dead man touches the bones of another dead man, who happens to be Elisha, and the dead man jumps up, and then it's over. We move on to verse 22 that has nothing to do with this situation. So I'm left wondering, what happened? That's a great movie. What happened? Did he come alive? And then stood there going, gee, this is awesome, great to be alive. Then the Moabite raiders killed him because they came down? Is that what happened? Did he only live for 25 seconds? I don't know. <coughs> or did he bounce alive, have time to go Moabite raiders and took off and the dead man beat the pole bearers in a foot race? I don't know what happened. It doesn't tell us anything. And so I go, why would you put that in there? 
What's the purpose and the point of a story like that? And so I've been thinking, God, I can only really draw a couple of simple thoughts out of this, but the one thing that keeps running around over and over inside my head is this, (coughs) that what you've got down here on earth is not necessarily going to be any good to you in heaven. There are things we have down here that are not going to be any good to you when you get to heaven. There are things that have been given to you down here on earth that if you don't use it, I guess you just lose it. If you don't do something with it, I guess it just dies with you. If you don't do something with it, when you go to walk through the gates, they're going to go at the baggage check section, and I, I, I'm not saying there is, maybe there's a baggage check section there, I don't know. And you've got your visa, Jesus, you can come in, but they check your bags. And they go, ah, can't take that with you, can't take that with you, don't need that up here, won't need that up here, won't need this up here. And they'll lighten your luggage before they let you through. <laughs> Elijah had something on his life. He had the power of God upon his life. But the power of God that was upon his life was no good to him when he got to heaven. He couldn't take it with him. And so it just stayed there. Oh, oh. You know what? All, if somebody didn't throw a dead body on his bones, we'd be completely oblivious to what was in, still resident within him. Isn't that a weird thought? There's this power resident within the bones of Elisha And God wanted someone to throw a body on it and then for it to be recorded. Two verses, that's it. Just two simple little verses that seem not to fit anyway. But God wanted us to have it. And it makes me wonder, what have you got and what have I got down here on earth that's going to be no good to anyone in heaven? What have we got upon our life or in our world, in our possession? What have we got right now that has great value and worth and use for the kingdom of God. But one day, it won't have any value or worth. We won't need it. We won't need it. Maybe Elisha still had that power here. Maybe God's saying, well, you don't need the power to heal the sick in heaven because there won't be any sick there. So use it while you're down here. You won't need uh, the, the authority to cast out demons or to preach the gospel and tell people about the Jesus story when you get there because everyone knows it, everyone's accepted it and there's no demons there. So use it while you're down here. Use it while you're down here. What is it that might be on your life or in your possession that you've got down here that's going to be of no value when you get to heaven? You're not going to be able to take it with you. You know, people say this phrase, they say you can't take it with you. Anyone ever heard people say that? Have you ever had a really good-meaning Christian, you know, really good-meaning believer, and you've just bought a new car or a new house or you've had a job promotion or something like that, and they'll come up and go, yes, but you can't take it with you, brother. You ever had that? It's like they want to pour water on your excitement, the fact that you might have just been blessed by... But you can't take it with you, brother. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Have you, anyone ever seen a study where, say, Harvard University or Yale University, one of these great bastions of intelligentsia, have ever gone out and, and, and come out with a paper and said, we surveyed 100,000 people and we asked them the question, do you really think you can take it with you? I've never seen that survey. You know why? Because I think most of us are smart enough to know that we can't take it with us. I don't need someone to come and tell me, oh, you can't take it with you. Most of us know that we can't take it with us. But sometimes I feel like when we throw that at people, you can't take it with you, I feel like we've got to be careful because don't downplay whatever it is. Don't downplay the it in your life. Whatever that it may be, that blessing might be in your world, don't downplay it. Because, yeah, you can't take it with you because it has no value there, but it can have great value down here, whatever it is. It can have great value down here. So be careful when we downplay and we patronizingly say, you you can't take it with you. Hey, look, people know they can't take it with them. It's not a matter of whether you can take it with you. 
It's what are you going to do with it while you've got it down here? What are you going to do with it for the benefit of the kingdom of God? What are you going to do with it for the benefit of the world while you're down here and while you've got whatever it is? That's really the question. Perhaps a better way to communicate this is if we word it this way. You can't take to heaven that which is meant to be used on earth. You can't take to heaven that which is meant to be used on earth. Here's the thing. The it in your life is a blessing. But the blessing is given to be used down here for a purpose. Whatever the it is in your world. I don't know what it is. But there are things that you're blessed with, things that are in your world that are given to you that are meant to be used down here. You can't take them with you. No, you can't. But the reason you can't take it with you is because it's got no value up there. There's no point. Why would you want it up there? Why would you want it? There's nothing down here that trumps the value of what you're going to get on the other side, so leave it. But while you're here and you've got it, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it while you're here? Did you know you can't take that encouraging word with you? So if you have it, use it. You've got an encouraging word in your heart. You've got something you like to build people up. Hey, guess what? Then do it while you can. It won't be needed up there. Everyone's going to be pretty secure. Everyone's going to be pretty healed and pretty whole. Everyone's, and plus, they're probably not even going to notice you because they're going to notice God. And, and, and so if you've got an encouraging word, something nice to say about somebody, say it. Do it now. There's no point doing it up there. No point leaving it in your bones. And when you go, you've got all these encouragements and compliments and things sitting there, resident in your bones. It's no good to anybody then. But while you're down here and you've got it, why don't you use it? Did you know you can't take the time with you that you have? You know, when you get up there, time, time as we know it is different. It's going to be different. That's, it, that, that's eternity. That's going to go on for a long, long, long... I can't, I don't, it's not even pointless saying a long, long time because I'm restricting it to time. It's just going to go on. But here, we've only got time. And I don't know how much time I've got. But did you know that you can't take the time with you that you have today? So if you have it now, use it. Use the time that you have. Use the time that you have for the building of the kingdom of God. Use the time that you have to glorify God in the earth. Use the time that you have to point people to Jesus. Use the time that you have to reflect the goodness of God. We sang about the goodness of God. Let's use the time we've got to, to, to reflect the goodness of God while we're down here. Did you know you can't take that idea with you? You know that idea you've got that's sitting around, rattling around inside you right now? Anyone ever have an idea, really great idea? Any of you have a hundred ideas, but you actually did nothing with any of the ideas? They're just ideas. Well, you can't take any of those ideas with you. Don't wait till you get to heaven. I've got an idea how we can clean up the streets of heaven. They're not dirty. They don't need your idea up there, but maybe someone needs your idea down here right now. You can't take that idea with you. You know, years ago, I came up with an idea. I came up with a game. Way back before we had PlayStations, all you young people um, might remember this, uh, we used to play games on boards. Yep, remember that? You thought games. And, and, and what I loved about them is you didn't have to get an extension lead to plug it in. There's a lot of benefits to the old way we used to play games. <coughs> But I realised time has moved on and, and it's all great. But way back then, before there was lots and lots of games, before there was ever an NRL on the PlayStation, I invented a game. And it was a fantastic game and it had about 10 different types of dice and I had a, a big thing. It was, was, was 70 metres, uh, 100 metres by 70 metres and I got a ruler out and marked it all in squares and had 13 players on each team and you roll the dice and it meant kick and chase and tackle and all this stuff and breaking tackles. I had a whole elaborate system. It was such a fantastic idea that all the adults around me said to me, Alan, you need to patent that because that is a brilliant game and a brilliant idea. And you know what I did? Nothing. Nothing. And about probably two years later, out comes this rugby league board game. And I'm looking at it going, oh, mine was better. It doesn't matter. Mine might have been better, but nobody knew about it and nobody benefited from it because it was just an idea that I did nothing with. But somebody else did something with that idea and they probably made $300. Because <laughs> board games phased out pretty quick and computers all came in not long after that. <coughs> What's that idea you've got? Maybe you've got an idea about how we can alleviate homelessness. 
Maybe you've got an idea about how we can get food to the poor. Maybe you've got an idea of how to get water to, to African communities. Maybe you've got an idea about how to help homeless uh, single mothers. Maybe you've got an idea about how we help get the, the youth on our streets involved in something, uh, finding some value and some self-esteem. Maybe you've got an idea. Well, that's brilliant that you've got an idea, but now's your chance to use the idea because when you get there, the idea's not going to be needed. It's going to be worthless. It's just going to be a memory. But God has given us ideas now. I wonder what the church would look like if people in the church decided to put a little bit of faith and, a little bit of, and take this, this, this little thing called risk and activate, put some action to some of these ideas that are out there. I don't know. Uh, uh, Sarah, is Sarah Luke in here? Sarah gone with the kids. I remember the day Sarah came along. She said, I've got an idea. Play and pray. Why don't we get some, some um, uh, mothers and, and with little kids and we'll just get together and the kids can play and then we can pray. And said, I'll make it unashamedly Christian. I don't care whether they know Jesus or not. Everybody's welcome, but they'll know when they come. We're going to pray and we believe in Jesus and so on. And I think the last, uh, might have been the last one or second last one before they broke for the year, they had something like... Uh, 12 mothers or something came along. I, I, I came up here to park the car and I thought there was a Sunday service on. There's that many people here. It was just an idea, but she just said, hey, let's have a crack at it, let's do something. And I wonder how many other ideas are floating around out there just waiting for somebody who has that idea to go, hey, I'll, I'll take a step of faith and I'll try something. I'll try something. Because the ideas you've got, they're active and they're great down here, but guess what? The idea's not going to benefit you when you go. You can't take that idea with you. So now's your time. Now's your time. You know all that finance you got? <laughs> you can't take it with you. Now I'm not saying, I'm not saying, give all your money away. No, no, you look after your, 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 your family. You be wise with your financial future. I've got no problem with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. In fact, I, I, I encourage people. You work hard. Enjoy the, the fruit of your labor. Nothing wrong with that. But the truth is, at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. But it's given to you now for a reason. It's given to you now for a reason. You know, it's amazing um, when I talk to people, you know, I'm going I'm to do some preaching later this year and we're going to talk about finances and I'll, I'll warn you all when we're doing that so that you don't want to invite your non-church friends to church who will walk in one day and go, told you, money all the time. I'll, I'll warn you about that when it comes. But what's amazing to me is, 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 is I meet so many believers who go, God owns everything. They don't believe in tithing, and I don't want to get into a tithing debate, but, but, but what I love about tithing is at least it's, it's, it's a, a, a boundary of, of, or, or a guideline of something that I contribute. And by the way, the tithe is not part of the law, came 400 years, whatever, before the law was ever given to the Jewish people. And it, it came before the law and outlived the law, nothing to do with the law. But we'll talk about that another time. But at the end of the day, here's the thing. I have these people that say God owns everything, 100% of everything. And you know what I found with most people like that? Generally what it means is God owns everything and they generally give nothing. I don't want to commit to nothing. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to do it. Because God owns everything. And it's so unfortunate and sad but most of the people that, that I know that say God owns everything give God very little. Yes, God owns everything. Of course he does. Of course he does. But that doesn't negate my responsibility to financially be a part of building his kingdom down here on earth. Hey, I don't argue when McDonald's sends me a thing on my phone and says two Big Mac meals for eight bucks. I think bargain. Eight bucks. Two Big Mac meals. That is, and I got it the other day, by the way, too. Two Big Mac meals, but I was in ISO. <laughs> I text back, stop doing this! It's cruel! You know what they're going to do with my money? <laughs> Give it to shareholders? Do whatever else? I know this, that eight bucks is not going to go into the kingdom of God. Pretty confident of that. Gone awfully quiet. But bottom line is this, you can't take it all with you, so if you have it, use it. Anyone you know, got that really fine china set that you keep in the cupboard? You know that really, really fine dinner set that you're saving for a special occasion? Anyone, anyone 
don't, don't, don't fib to me. Yeah, there's a couple of hands, a couple of people. We've got that dinner set that's for a special occasion. Remember that? We used, we used to have lots of those you know, special occasion things. You know what we realised one day? Special occasion never comes. <laughs> These things are so precious to us that the occasion is never special enough. And we just thought, ah, blah, you just break it out and start using it. Hey, guess what? While you got it, use it. While you got it, use it. Make the occasion special by bringing out your special china. Then it became a special, what's a special occasion? We're using special china. Isn't that special? For most of us, so much of our life is like that china. It's just sitting there waiting, the ideas, the encouragements, the, 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 the fights. It's all just kind of sitting there in the cupboard waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And the days turn into months and the months turn into years and the years turn into decades. It just rolls on, doesn't it? Just rolls on and on and on. God wants us to use it now. God wants us to use it now. The power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that's upon your life, you can't take it with you. So if you have it, use it. If you have it, use it. Preach the good news. Heal the sick, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead. Freely you've received, freely give. The power of God upon your life, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. I, 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 I come across so many people because I teach on some of the, the, in evangelism teaching on YWAM schools for, I've been doing it for 20 something odd years now. And I'll ask them this simple question, how many of you have seen a sick person healed? And they'll go, no, nah, never. And then I'll follow it up with, how many sick people have you prayed for? And they'll go, none. <laughs> well, there's a correlation there. I'm making a connection point. And I'm not that smart. We've got all this power and authority that Jesus has given to us. You know, John Wimber, anyone ever know about John Wimber, started the Vineyard Movement? Yeah? Anyone ever read his story about how he began with, with, with praying for the sick and so on? John Wimber, he, he just read in this word one day that, 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 that God has given us authority to, to cast out demons and, and power to heal the sick. And so he just said, God, I'll just take you at my word. Most of us don't take God at his word. We take God at our experience, don't we? If we're brutally honest, most of us take God at our own personal experience, not God at his word. Well, he decided he was going to take God at his own word. Up to that point, he wasn't somebody that prayed for the sick in his church. But he came across it and he said, right, that's, that's what it says. So I'm going to take you, God, at my word, and we're going to start praying. So every service, he would say at the end of the service, anybody sick, come forward for prayer. Now, it's not amazing to me that a preacher would say to a congregation, if you're sick, come forward for prayer. That's not amazing to me. What's amazing to me being a pastor and a preacher is that people actually did it. Sometimes that's the most amazing thing. We've all got our reasons why we don't respond, but in his particular case, this little lady came forward and a couple of other people, they prayed for them and guess what happened? Absolutely nothing. And so the next week, you know what he did at the end of the service? He did the same thing. He said, you know what? The power of God's present to heal. Uh, we've been given authority. We can pray for the sick. Jesus, in fact, commanded his disciples to go and do it. So if you're sick, come forward. So they did. And they prayed again a second service. You know what happened? Absolutely the same thing that happened to me the second time I sat on the end of my bed and said, Lord, would you, you know, open up the room? Nothing. Nothing happened. He did it a third time and a fourth time. You know, he, he, I've, I've read his books. I've heard him, seen his writings where he says this and I've heard him preach this and say this, that he prayed for over a thousand people. And they weren't a mega church, by the way. They were just a small, smallish, normal little, little church. And he said, we prayed for over 1,000 people before we saw our first person healed in a Sunday morning service. Can you imagine that? That's what I mean when I say, I'm not surprised that he kept saying it. I'm really surprised that the congregation kept coming forward. I'm surprised because how many people here come forward and get prayed and go, well, nothing happened and we sit down and then next time around, maybe we'll get a second time, the third time, forget it, been there, done that, doesn't work, nothing happens. And before you know it, you end up with an entire um, gathering of people where there's very little faith and very little expectation because it didn't happen straight away. Didn't happen straight away. But he just kept on plugging away, plugging away, and they kept coming forward. And after about a thousand nothings, all of a sudden somebody got healed. And then you can imagine faith began to build and expectation began to build. And then before you know it, he's traveling around the world preaching uh, and bringing the whole, ushering the Holy Spirit into different churches and different types of groups. Hey, we have the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives as well today, right now. It's not a matter of feelings. It's not a matter of emotion. It's a matter of fact that Jesus proclaimed and said, if you follow me, you're anointed. You have the Holy Spirit upon your life. My, my, my believers have been commissioned to preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, uh, this is what we've been called to do. This is what uh, uh, God 
has put the power of God upon our life to do. And guess what? You can't take it with you. And you know what? I reckon there's going to be a lot of people, and I don't believe there'll be regret in heaven. I don't believe there will be. I believe when we get to heaven, regret will be cut off. We won't regret nothing. But I'll tell you this. If I know that I'm knocking on heaven's door and I've got enough time to think back and reflect on my life, here's what I do believe. And statistics and studies have shown this, that a lot of people live with regret when they look back at their life and look at the chances they didn't take and the things they didn't do. And I reckon there'll be nothing worse than a believer getting to the end and looking back and going, you know what, I just did not contribute, I didn't dive into, I didn't make the kingdom of God a priority for my life, I didn't preach the gospel, I didn't pray for anyone, I didn't care about anybody, I lived for myself, I I enjoyed the blessing of God for me, but I did not pass that blessing on to others, I didn't serve, I didn't do anything of that nature, I just went through life like everybody else, but I was a believer, and I'm going to get into heaven, but if I've got time to think about it, and I look back, I wonder how many of us will have a little stain of regret at the end because we didn't realize that we've, what we've got down here, what's given to us down here, can only be used down here. We can't take it with us. We cannot take it with us. It's not going to happen. I asked you at the beginning, uh, two weeks ago, the beginning of the year, I asked you we were excited about what God was going to do in 2022. And I believe, I still am. I've, I have not had a great start to 2022, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I spent nine days in ISO already with COVID and just before that, I'm sitting at my desk doing some work and I look down at my feet and I've got a brown snake at my feet. I didn't even notice he'd been there making noises and all of a sudden, I've got a brown snake there and i got COVID. It has not been a great start to the year for me. But you know what? I do have expectation about what God is going to do. I have expectation about what God is going to do. But here's the thing. I soaked for a week. I spent a week soaking and I didn't realise I was soaking with God. And when I came out, Here's what I've come out with from my time. I feel like God said this. Am I going to be excited about what you're going to do in 2022? It's one thing for me to be excited about what God's going to do, but you know what I notice in the Bible? God jumps on the back of what we do. He jumps on the back of what we do. Wish I was standing there just before Jesus ascended and he said to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then as he ascended, they got together in a huddle and said, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. And Jesus popped back through the cloud and said, boys, you're missing the point. I told you to do something and I'll be with you. Now would you go and start doing it? Would you go and start using what you have? Would you go and start extending the kingdom? Would you go and start preaching? Would you go and start healing? Would you go and start declaring? Would you go and start? Would you go and start? Would you take that idea? Would you do it? I'm excited about what God's going to do, but my question or challenge to each of us is when God looks down upon your life for 2022, is God going to be excited about what you're going to do? Is God excited about what you're going to do in 2022? I wonder... Are we willing to give God something to get excited about or are we simply going to live another year waiting for him to give us something to get excited about? I don't know about you. I've made a decision in 2022. I want to give God something to get excited about. I want to do some things in 2022. I want to put some legs and some action to some things in 2022. I don't want to talk about having the power of God. I want to use it more. I don't want to talk about authority. I want to exercise it more. I want to move more in the direction of what God has. I want to put my hand to the plow. I want to make a difference in 2022. That's what I want to do because I can sit back for another year and wait for God to do something. And God's been sitting up there twiddling his fingers, I guess, saying, you know what, I'm waiting for you because I said you go and do and I will jump on the back of that. I will be with you. I will anoint you. I will give you the power. I'll give you everything you need to do it. But you've got to do something. You've got to do something. Just do something. In closing, I was listening to an interview while I was in ISO. And um, it was an interview with Lee Strobel. Anyone know Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ? Lee Strobel, he was an investigative journalist whose wife became a believer. And uh, he decided to use his investigative journalism experience and for two years went around and studied the, uh, the, the crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus in the hope that being the intelligent man that he was, that he could go back to his wife with the facts and prove that this whole religion is just 
a shambles and not true. After two years of investigating about his need of Jesus, he said there's too much evidence and became a believer. And now he's a great apologist for the faith. He goes around and he defends the faith of Christianity and, and comes at it from a very intellectual perspective and does an amazing job. Well, I was listening to an interview with him this week and he shared an experience that he had with Louis Palau. Anyone know Louis Palau? Louis Palau was a, a South American, Argentinian, I think, uh, evangelist. Thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people came to faith through the life of Louis Palau. And he got to interview Louis Palau just before he died. Louis Palau passed away recently of stage four cancer. Why? Do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. But God's still good. Just before he passed away of stage four cancer, in fact, it was the last interview he ever did before he passed away. And he made this statement to Lee Strobel. He said, when you get to the end of your life and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. When you get to the end of your life, and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. I I, I wonder, I wonder whether there are people in this room and you're going to make the decision 2022. I'm not going to wait till the end of my life. I just want to get to the end of the year and look back and say, I don't regret anything because I was courageous this year for Christ. Boy, if God could find a community of people that did that, I think that's the kind of community that could shake a suburb. That's the kind of community that could shake a town. That's the kind of community that could bring change to a nation. That's the kind of community from which I believe the world could be a better place. I hope and pray it's us. 